tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations about evil entities and atrocious art. I'm Jason Hill, host of the Horror Hill podcast now in its third season, available on Spotify Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and wherever podcasts can be found. If you can't get enough of the macabre, head on over to my neck of the woods after today's show. Tonight, I'll be filling in for Steve Taylor, and I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Robert Davis and Gray Lospina our voice talents Jesse Cornett and Barry Bowman. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds. Embrace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our first tale tonight comes to us from author Robert Davis and is performed by Jesse Cornett. In it, we'll travel to the wintry, isolated regions of Europe, where a local law enforcement officer has been summoned to a small village to investigate the disappearance of a young girl, an investigation that will change him forever. Without further ado, I present to you Long Fingers and the Children of Snow. I am the only policeman in this village of 112 people. This village is located in the middle of nowhere, Poland. It's very cold here, and therefore very snowy. A sunny day here is as rare as a snowy day in a desert. The snow is always at least two feet high. I arrived here a week ago. The people here are people of tradition and very primitive. They have very basic medical supplies, one TV and one computer with very unreliable internet. Being raised in the city my whole life, I was not used to this. They have no Wi-Fi or phone reception. The computer is connected with a router. If someone has anything to report, they run to the police station, which is little more than a one-roomed cabin. Before I came, the village didn't have any policemen. The reason for my arrival was that a little girl went missing. Her footprints went north in a straight line for about a hundred steps. Then they just ended. Where they ended was even more odd. They ended in an open field. No other tracks, nothing. The only thing that was nearby was a small forest north of the field. I couldn't perform a full-scale search, but I searched the vicinity where the tracks ended. I didn't find her body. Her description was blonde hair down to her shoulder, blue eyes, and about four feet six inches tall. I searched for two hours and found nothing. So I went home. At about 9 p.m., a woman came in and told me in Polish that her little boy wasn't in bed. I rushed outside and immediately went to the field. 
Now, when I tell people what I saw, they don't believe me. But I know what I saw. The boy was standing there gazing at the forest. There was this figure standing at the edge of the forest. The figure was ten feet tall, with legs and arms that were long and bony. His palms were the size of my face, his fingers each a foot long. The nails were razor sharp. Its skin was pale. He began walking towards the child. Its long strides were deliberate and slow. It looked like it was walking in slow motion. As he got closer, I saw that it left no footprints. It was as if it was walking a few millimeters above the snow. Its eyes were all black. They were like polished obsidian. Now, it was very close. It picked up the child in its large hands and slowly walked away. As it turned to walk away, it flashed a smile at me. Its teeth were long and thin like pencils, and they were slightly curved. This sort of encounter occurred until all the children were gone. Every time I saw it, it would smile at me. I would stand there frozen and unmoving, unable to stop the abomination in front of me from taking the poor child. The villagers trusted me, so they didn't bother me about the investigation. One day, I decided to enter the forest. It was dense with tightly packed trees, so I made very slow progress. After days of searching, I came across a shack. It was dilapidated and covered in snow. A sign read, Shechkola, Preschool. I was unable to make out what the rest said. It was smudged out. I slowly opened the door. Inside was a nursery of some sort. Dust covered everything. There were bouncy balls, crayons, a drawing board, shelves of toys and children's books, and little miniature wooden chairs. There was also a picture of an elderly woman standing behind a line of children in formal attire. The picture was in black and white and was covered in many layers of dust. The children all looked to be the ages of four to seven. The picture was titled Mrs. Diogo's Preschool. But there was something weird about the picture. In the background of the picture, there was some sort of figure. It was blurry, but the figure had long fingers and was very tall. I left immediately after seeing that eerie photo. Then... Something odd began happening. When I got back to the cabin I was staying in, there was a note. It said, stop looking around, in blue crayon. It was in children's handwriting, no doubt. All the letters were capitalized and the R was written backwards. I crumbled up the note and I threw it into the trash can. I went out to consult the elderly Mrs. Batko. She had been here since anybody could remember. I questioned her about Mrs. Diogo. She said in a very raspy whisper, Mrs. Diogo was murdered 50 years ago by her husband. She ran a preschool for the children of the village. I inquired how she was murdered. They just found her with a hole in her forehead. It was a perfect circle. Her husband disappeared when they found her body. I asked her what Diogo meant in Polish. She sounded surprised. It means long. Diogo means long, my son. The next day, at noon, a man came running to my cabin. The children, they are here. I jumped out of my chair. Where? I asked. He frantically pointed northwards. 
the edge of the forest. I ran outside. It was cloudy, but not foggy. I went towards the clump of adults, whispering in hushed tones and frantically looked at the edge of the forest. From where I was standing, I could see the children. They were lined up shoulder to shoulder, staring straight ahead. The girls had pure white dresses on, while the boys had pure white collared shirts on. They also had holes in their foreheads. They were perfectly circular. A figure emerged from the forest. It was the figure. He pointed with one of his long fingers toward the village. The children started to advance across the snowy field. I am the only survivor of this incident. The children killed everyone. But me, the children were efficient in their killing. It only lasted five minutes. When they were finished, the figure beckoned for them to return to him. They mindlessly walked back across the field and into the forest. Then the figure smiled, turned, and walked back into the forest. This episode of Chilling Tales for Dark Nights is brought to you by Best Fiends. Do you ever find yourself dipping forkfuls of mac and cheese into ranch dressing before stuffing it into your mouth at three in the morning? Do you ever spend hours looking at videos of people's pets engaging in adorable or otherwise unorthodox behaviors while you're supposed to be working? Have you ever kept your underwear in the freezer? Guilty pleasures? <laughs> We've all got them. Even I've been known to sink my teeth into that forbidden fruit from time to time. But if you want to know more, you'll just have to ask around. And pleasure is pleasure, of course. And I might just have one for you of which you may need feel no guilt at all. That's right. I'm talking about Best Fiends. Best Fiends gives me an endless source of fun and mental stimulation that I can access anytime, right there on my phone. It's a match three puzzle game like none other, with literally thousands of levels and new content being added all the time. Now I've been playing Best Fiends for a while now, but with the intuitive controls and expertly tuned difficulty curve, it's almost as if I've always been playing Best Fiends. Ooh. Spooky. I'll admit, I'm a little obsessed. And when I start fiending for some fiends, them fiends ain't never far. I played best fiends on a plane. I've played best fiends on a train. And when I use my brain, new levels do I attain. And it's never a pain. Because best fiends is super fun and challenging. And you can play it anywhere, anytime, even on horseback. Yes, I actually did that. It's cowboy country out here, everyone's got a horse. There's more horses than cars. So what are you waiting for? Best Fiends makes boredom hurt. And when boredom screams, Best Fiends lies back and listens to that sweet, sweet music. Get to it. Over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must play. More levels, events, and challenges are added all the time. So play away because there's always one more level. Seriously, download Best Fiends and watch boredom bleed. Download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. Remember, that's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. I hope you enjoyed Long Fingers and the Children of Snow, as written by Robert Davis and performed by Jesse Cornett. Up next, we've got a second sinister story for you. This one a classic, originally published in 1934 in the infamous pages of Weird Tales. Authored by Gray Lospina and brought to life by Barry Bowman, this tale introduces the dark side of art. 
There's an old saying that claims that art often imitates life. But what happens when it's the other way around? <laughs> Now, without further ado, I present to you the Sinister Painting. The taxi drove off, leaving Funk on the Hoddesdon lawn, surrounded by valises. Funk was thinking it more than merely odd that Barclay, for whose coaching he'd come prepared to spend the month, had not met him as planned. He tried the screen door. It was hooked inside. Hello in there. There was no response. The Hoddeston farm lay drenched in a torpid lethargy for which it was obvious more than the July heat must be responsible. Within the house, no one stirred. On the surrounding fields, no one was abroad. Even the usual sounds of the farm animals were hushed. Funk was unpleasantly affected. Surely the entire household had not gone to meet his train and somehow missed it. He carried his traps to the stoop, crossed the yard to the barnyard, and hallowed again. Hello! He knew of old where Barclay's studio was, so he set off down the path toward the grateful shade of the woods. The grey stone walls of the old building soon glinted through the tree trunks in heavy foliage. A strong conviction possessed Funk that Barclay was not within. In fact, he found the studio door padlocked. He noted that the west window was rudely boarded up. He walked around the studio to the north. Here, the trees had been cut down, and the studio wall was entirely of glass. He peered in with deepening curiosity. But apart from the usual litter of easels, painting paraphernalia and accessories, canvases in serried rows against the walls, his attention was almost immediately drawn to a painting propped against the south wall where the full light from the opposite windows poured in revealingly. Hmm, wrong girl, that never is Barclay's work, and he'd never let a student perpetrate such a monstrosity of hue and crude color. He pressed his face to the glass, cupping it against the outside light. That old man, it may be crudely done, but he's also absolutely horrible. His hands, ugh, they're dead hands, bloodless, waxen, ugh. Something about the way he's sitting there, drooping as if he hadn't the strength of himself to sit erect and was being held by something, something without that you can't see. Well, I don't like that thing. It's, it's ugly. There's... There's something wrong with it. He said this last with conviction, and as he exclaimed, became aware of another gaze fixed upon himself. He snapped upright and wheeled quickly, waiting patiently for him to finish his examination of the studio's interior, stood a man in patched, stained blue overalls. Well? Uh, Mr. Barclay's at the house, sir. You're, you're Mr. Funk? I'm, um, I'm Malkaihi, Hoddeston's hired man. Uh, oh, all right. I'm coming. How did Mr. Barclay come to miss my train? Well, we was all down to the police station, sir. Police station? What, what, what's been going on here? Uh, I found Mr. Oki uh, dead in the studio this morning, sir. What? Oh, there's something wrong in there, sir. I, I saw the blood on the, on the old devil's beard. Oh, snap out of it, Mulcahy. Are you referring to that picture? I am not, sir. Blood on the old man's beard? It's ridiculous. I saw none. Oh, blood it was, sir. And the poor young man's was all drained out of him, sir. Ha! <laughs> this sounds intriguing. Blood on the old man's beard? I'm dripping from his dead finger, sir. And not one drop left in the corpse, sir. Blood all over the damned old devil's whiskers and on his dead fingers, sir. Oh, merry mother. Who did that painting? A man by the name of Silva, sir. He, he's after being a cabinet maker, but he got to thinking he could paint, so... He made that beauty back there. Devil fly away with him. Mm, he sure can paint. Oh, he's mixing something with his paint that only the devils from the, the pit can give him. Sir, the night before the poor lad was murdered, there was a fine canvas of Mr. Barclay's cut into ribbons, and Mr. Oakey's prize picture the same. What might that mean, along with the poor lads being killed the next night? And, and Silva only, only getting uh, honorable mention last week where he was looking for first prize. Oh, looks as if Silva had a motive. 
Life was stirring normally about the farm now, as if a ban of enchanted silence had been lifted. Funk could see Barkley's bulky body leaning over the valises on the front stoop. He hailed his friend and then asked Mulcahy hastily, What did the police say? Any one of us might have done it, sir. But the studio was locked from the inside, and there's no motive. And they can't figure where the poor lad's blood went, sir. Back of the simple words pushed a dark significance of terrible things. Looks as if there were more here than appears on the surface. Oh, right ye are, sir. From now on, Tom Mulcahy wears a blessed medal next to his hide, day and night. Funk met Barclay's welcoming hand with a heartening grip. Uh, sorry to have missed you, Funk, but this ghastly tragedy has dislocated all plans. I, I was fond of the boy. He had a gift, had he? Uh, I, was, I was looking forward to what he would do with color in not far future, and uh, now... Where's my room, Barclay? Funk gathered up his bags and followed the other painter up the front steps. Both men lighted cigarettes in silence. Barclay stared abstractedly from the window, while Funk unpacked rapidly, puffing clouds of smoke about himself as he tossed shirts, underwear, ties into the open bureau drawers. I want to know how Silva's paintings got into your studio. So you're taking that attitude? Uh, well, anybody but a crass, materialistic jackass would. Yeah, I didn't know you went in for that sort of thing. Well, I have no time for anything but painting. Just making a living takes most of my time these days, Funk. Well, a very little suffices for me. I'm too fascinated with studying the truths underlying the illusions of material existence. Not that I've gotten very far, but uh, what I know, I know. Uh, then perhaps you can say what's unnatural about poor Harry's death. I know there's something wrong about it. Something wrong? Yes, there's something wrong and uncanny about the lad's death. As to its being unnatural, well, there are many strange and little-known laws operating along lines so new to us. Uh, I believe the poor chap's death is due to an extremely interesting example of the transference of an evil will to power. Well, I didn't tell the police what I felt lay behind this tragedy. I have no hankering to live in an insane asylum. Now I have faint hope that you may be able to appreciate the strangeness of my experience. Listen, Manuel Silva settled here a few years ago, and he's been doing well as a cabinet maker. Recently he learned that I got from $300 up for a canvas, and he thought this was an easy way to get rich, <laughs> but I refused to teach him. Well, you know I never take any but advanced students of decided promise. My refusal roused Silva's furious resentment. I've instituted an annual art exhibit in town. Silva entered three canvases to force my hand. They were rather terrible. One was a, a blacksmith, dark, sullen, sinister. He was hammering viciously at what appeared to be a battered crucifix. Another was a, a farmer slaughtering a wretched hog that somehow looked like a naked man. The butcher's face wore a too realistic grin of sadistic enjoyment as he wielded his bloody knife. Uh, the third, well, the third was the painting you've just seen in my studio. Harry's entry took first prize. This, this was inevitable. I felt inclined to encourage a couple of young local artists, so I gave them honorable mention. And not to slight Silver's pride, I included him. The night before the canvases were removed, Harry and I were in the gallery and he pointed out that someone had deliberately cut the honorable mention ribbon and Silva's canvas so that it hung in dangling strips. Odd that, eh? Oh, you're opening vistas. You're absolutely interesting. Well, I criticized Silva's paintings, observing that Harry was right when he said it gave him the jitters, but that in just that degree it possessed a touch of wild genius. Harry pronounced it ghastly, to paint a hunched-up old man as dead as a doornail, his hands frightful, decomposing, yet sitting up there. Ugh! Silver's colors were crude, his drawing distorted. Just how it would be difficult to say, but wrong, you understand, just wrong. I said I dared not encourage Silver because of a very strange quality in his work, that that's something wrong. And then we both nearly jumped out of our skins, for in the dusk behind us, someone broke into an ugly chuckle, and we turned to see a dark figure slouching out. It was Silver, 
and I realized that he'd heard me pronounce him an evil genius. Harry made light of my compunctions, but I was, I was disturbed. We confronted the old man in the painting once more. As twilight gained the room, a murky dusk seemed creeping into the very canvas. Its shadows deepened. The old man merged into his dark background, all but his pallid face, his grayish beard, the waxen fingers dropping over his angular knees. It was wrong, entirely wrong. And then all at once Harry twitched my sleeve and exclaimed, Let's get out of here and we turned and plunged into the night, stricken by some subtle panic so obsessing that it was not until we were back at the Hoddesdon farm that we realized how, <laughs> how foolish and unreasonable had been our flight. Funk lighted another cigarette. We went sketching next day, and, and Hoddesdon brought our canvases back to the studio. That night he told me that Silva had sent me one of his for a gift, so Harry and I went down to see which one. We lighted candles, and really we got a nasty shock. The flickering, inadequate candlelight made that old man appear more than ever an entity with a horrid existence, independent of his painted presentment. Oh, my God! Harry said, my God, in, in a kind of comic dismay. And I knew instinctively that Silver was up to no good. He, he bore me malice. His very gift seemed to convey dire menace. In the pale candlelight, the old man's beard appeared to rustle stiffly as if his lips were parting under his bushy shelter. Of course, I could not see anything, but I, I felt that I was seeing a, a pale dead tongue flick moisture over dry dead lips. <laughs> oh, that must have been an odd sensation. You make it very clear. Yes? Well, there's more of it, Funk. Oki and I went over our canvases to check on their return and good condition. We were satisfied. Just remember this point, will you? We padlocked the studio door and went off to bed. When we went in next morning, the padlock was undisturbed and all the windows locked on the inside. But one of my best canvases had been slit into ribbons, and Harry's, which had taken first prize, was completely demolished, even the, th the frame. That last act of vandalism made me feel bad. I'd been sure the boy could cash in on his work, and he needed the money. He took it like a Spartan, but he told me he was going to sleep in the studio that night, for he felt sure that Silva had done the damage. And I agreed, although I, I couldn't figure out how Silva could have gotten inside. So last night I left the boy there. He said he was going to hang something over the old man's gosh-awful face. I offered to stay with him, but he, he wouldn't have it. And this morning, this morning... Malkai told me. Uh, it was ghastly funk. Malkai was howling blood at every jump he took. Blood, he yelled, on the old man's beard. Hmm. How about the coroner? Harry had been dead for hours. Finger marks on his throat. Every drop of blood drained from his body. Malkai had seen him through the north windows. I had to break the west window to get in. The coroner said at first he'd had a fit, but finally decided he'd been killed by a person unknown. About the blood? Uh, Melkai was right about it, Funk. I saw it too. It's not there now. Yeah, that's another strange thing. When I rushed over, I found poor Harry sprawling on the floor, his body all twisted in a grotesque, gruesome position and so terribly white. As I threw myself on the floor beside him, something struck upon my inner ear. It it was a sound, but such a sound. Even as I heard it, I knew I was hearing what could not be apprehended physically. I sprang to my feet and confronted Silva's hideous canvas. God, it was horrible. <sighs> the painted old man sat there motionless, but it was a sinister restraint funk. I stared, stricken by a horror that affected me with nausea, for I saw then that Someone had smeared that ancient's deadly pallor with crimson that crawled down the painted gray beard. The dead hands that hung over the angular knees were dripping ev every pallid fingertip with blood. Blood, Funk. How do you know it was blood? I... I touched it. And then... A ghastly thing came to pass. I did not see it. I felt rather than saw. I became aware with that inner sense of the movement of one of the old man's painted arms. It lifted with the jerking unevenness of, of an automaton. 
and passed across the stained gray beard. I say it moved. I felt it move. Yet at the same time I was aware that it was only painted, hence incapable of movement. It was a something else behind it that actually moved. I, 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 I find it almost impossible to clarify my intuitions, other than to say that while the painted figure did not stir, I, I was yet inwardly aware that it lifted one arm and wiped away the crimson from its beard. Then it reached out on either side to drag off that horrible drip from its waxen fingertips against the painted glass that reddened under them. Oh, God! It was more than horrible, because although the figure did not show movement to my straining eyes, yet I saw the crimson lifeblood of poor Harry disappearing from the canvas as those movements, which I felt rather than saw, took place. <sighs> of course, this explanation is inadequate. Funk pushed the consumed tip of his cigarette to the fresh one he was holding between his thin lips. A cloud of smoke enveloped him. Not adequate, my dear fellow. On the contrary, it is very enlightening. So clear that I believe we may yet punish the murderer of that poor lad. Oh, I'd give a year of my life to accomplish that. Well, I hardly think so much will be required, but you may have to sacrifice one or two of your canvases. We'd better get the rest of Oki's work over here, and Silva must learn that you are taking steps to protect Harry's work and your own. He must be informed that tomorrow night you yourself will sleep in the studio. That will bring him. Uh, you agree that it's Silva? I've no doubt about it, but not in propria persona. He's projecting his astral body through that hideous old man, and he's already made a grave error. What do you mean? He's permitted himself to savor human blood. Hence, he cannot be permitted to continue. He's dangerous now. He will be yet more so, unless checked. I propose to do this in the only permanent way possible. We have no proof of his presence in the studio, Funk. Uh, who would believe the intangible evidence of my experience? No one ordinarily. But I believe. And there's another person who will not only believe, but will furnish me with the means of putting a stop to Silva's murderous proclivities, without disturbing the authorities unduly. Wouldn't it be wise to return that picture to Silva, or cut it to bits and burn it? Later. You see, Silva has somehow learned how to transfer his will for evil to that creature of his own making. It's through the same creation that we must reach him and stop his criminal career before it's too late. Uh, you speak as if you knew what you were talking about, Funk. I can't just understand you, but I feel that you're, you're somehow right. What do you wish done? Get Melkaye or Hardiston to clear out all Oki's canvases. Leave only a couple of your own that you don't particularly care about so as not to stir Silver's suspicions overly. He'll imagine you're exhibiting. Then have Hardiston step in and tell Silva what happened to the canvases in the studio and ask him to have his moved out of harm's way. That will appear a kindly impulse on your part, and he will reply that he'll send for his canvases in a couple of days. He'll figure on polishing you off by then. <laughs> Agreeable thought, that. Now, you're going to lend me your roadster. I'll be back tomorrow afternoon at the latest. Be sure Sylvie is given to understand that tomorrow night you'll be sleeping in the studio. Under no circumstances, however, venture in there tonight. Tonight, Silva, or whatever wakens in the studio under the stimulus of his evil purpose, may have free play. But tomorrow night, ah, tomorrow night, I shall be there, not you. Oh, I won't permit your getting into a nasty situation, Funk. This, this, this isn't your affair. After all, Harry was my protege. It's up to me. Aha. Are you prepared to give effective battle to a painted demon, Barkley? Can you, through that painted thing, silence forever the intangible, distant malefactor? You can do such things? I shall know how to before I return tomorrow afternoon. Uh, but how? I'm going to someone who knows. I shall demand the secret. She will yield it, I'm certain. I'm going to see Gwen Caradorn. Uh, where have I heard that name? Possibly in connection with her published brochures. Her reality of the abstract is fairly well known. It's discussed everywhere. Uh, quite likely. I seem to remember it vaguely. Now, how about your car? It was dusk when Funk returned on the following day. The seriousness and abstraction that wove a cloak about him struck Barclay's curious inquiries into silence. A certain high air about the younger artist forbade imperiously any break upon that lofty mood. Funk's first query was, 
had Silva been duly informed of the occupation of the studio that night. Oh, he knows. He told Hardiston that he would call for his unappreciated masterpiece in a couple of days. The words were significantly emphasized. I'd rather fancied he'd say that. He knows you'll be there tonight. Uh, Hardiston told him if there were any further trouble, uh, I'd sleep there tonight on to protect his painting. Excellent. And was there any? Yes. Last night, the two canvases I'd left were demolished. Good. He'll be expecting you to sleep there tonight. Let's have supper, and then I'll run into town and fetch Miss Caradon. She insists upon coming out. The time was too brief to prepare me to handle the situation single-handed. Mm, that's extraordinarily kind of her, Funk, but if she's to be at the studio tonight, why, why, why not I? She would have handled it alone, only that uh, she... Sorry, I can't be more explicit, but she bans discussion of herself unless she decides to come out into the open, which she rarely does. She's... Well, wait until you meet her, if she permits it. You you'll understand then. But believe me, she is worthy of the highest respect and admiration a human being could expect. Funk did not have to drive to town. Between dusk and dark, a shining dark blue car with a special delivery body slipped into the driveway. From the limousine-like front, two uniformed men alighted and walked to the rear of the car. There were wide doors there, which they proceeded to open. They withdrew with the utmost care a strange anachronism, a blue and black and gold decorated sedan chair, small and delicate. They placed themselves between the shafts and started toward the farmhouse. Funk exclaimed and sprang down the steps to meet the odd equipage. He bent over what was obviously an extended hand, white in the dusk. Barclay, staring, saw the young artist touch his lips to those extended fingers. A child's high, shrilly, sweet voice gave an order, and the chair-bearers carried the sedan chair toward the barnyard. Funk followed, calling back as he went. See you tomorrow morning, Barclay. With that, he disappeared after the chair into the soft darkness beyond the barnyard. Barclay felt that he could not sleep. He was intensely irritated that Gwen Caradorn should have sent a child to take her place in what he felt must be a post of danger. He went down to the shining automobile and walked around it with curiosity. The rear doors had been closed, and nothing marked it as out of the ordinary, save perhaps the expensive type of shock absorbers for a delivery body, and of course what looked very like a periscope set in the top as much out of place as was a modern child in a sedan chair. He sat at his window, fell asleep there in his chair, and did not waken until Mrs. Hoddiston tapped at his door, calling that Mr. Funk and the little girl had returned. She volunteered that the little girl was a perfect little French doll. Barclay took the stairs, three at a stride. In the hall, Funk sat on a hassock, which brought his face slightly below the level of the small, oval countenance of the child, who sat sedately on the half-chair. Barclay noted with an artist's appreciation the bloom on her dazzling cheeks, the straight nose, the richly scarlet mobile lips. He approved the curling black lashes, finely penciled arching eyebrows, sleek black bobbed hair, her creamy silk dress, rather long than worn by most children of her age, apparently about six, was smocked in a knowing fashion with bright colors. Her feet were inappropriately encased in high-heeled French slippers. All this the artist in Barclay captured at a glance just as he took in the beauty of the slender, tiny hands of the taper fingers and the eloquence of every gesture. A strange and unusual child, this. His leaping footsteps brought upon him a lifting of fringed eyelids and what he felt shrinkingly was a glance of indifference. He stopped short at the foot of the staircase, abashed at this disdainful glance. He knew all at once why this child's frock was longer than customary, why her tiny feet wore adult-style footgear, why sophistication animated those taper fingers. The cobalt blue eyes that regarded him from the child's elfin face were the eyes of a grown woman. They were the informed eyes of one who had passed through the fires of varied experiences, the eyes of one who had gazed unafraid upon unveiled mysteries. The child was not a child, but was an exquisite midget, a creature set apart from the entire world by her miniature proportions. Funk sprang up, caught the other man's hand, and drew him down to the hassock, himself sinking upon the floor so that both men's faces were below the level of the midgets. Barclay, 
Miss Caradorn permits me to present you. Uh, honored, Miss Caradorn. Uh, Barclay sat, still confused under the keen gaze of those faintly derisive blue eyes. He understood it after a minute. She was touched with amusement at his discomfiture. An elfish smile twitched at one corner of her scarlet lips, and she actually turned away those two shrewd eyes as if to spare Barclay's feelings, a kindly gesture which did not serve to tranquilize him, for there was just a touch of condescension in her half-smile. Mr. Funk has been showing me these canvases from your studio. I would very much like that snow scene. It is charming. If you will tell me the price. I, I would feel honored if you would accept it as a, a proof of my gratitude for your having come here. Uh, You're anxious to learn the outcome of last night's plans? Suspended in the bosom of her frock by a slender platinum chain was a platinum whistle which she put to her lips and sounded. At once, the bearers of the sedan chair came up the steps and into the hall, holding the chair close to their mistress. Like some bright bird, so airy and graceful was her lithe movement, she seemed to fly from her chair into the sedan's shelter. She waved one tiny hand. The bearers took their light burden outside, slid it into place in the rear of the waiting automobile. They mounted into the front, and the car slipped noiselessly away down the road, bespeaking the many-cylindered motor by its very silence and power. Ah, so that strange little thing is your wonderful Gwen Caradorn? Why didn't you warn me? Funk lighted the cigarette hastily and began surrounding himself with smoke. Why didn't I? Because she won't be talked about. She's proud and sensitive. She considers her miniature body the ultimate of human perfection and won't permit its comparison with what she considers our gross bodies. And she's abnormally proud of her brain. She has reason to be. I, I think it's the most highly developed I've ever known. As an oculist, she's the seventh daughter of a seventh daughter. You're anxious to know about last night. She's forbidden me to divulge details, but I may tell you briefly that Silva will never again repeat his evil act. He was there then, last night? Not in propria persona, but his familiar was already locked in with us when I bolted the door behind Gwen and myself. What, what, what do you mean? Let's go down to the studio. It's easier to understand when you've seen things with your own eyes. The telephone rang. Mrs. Huddleston ran out of the kitchen and answered it. An expression of horror settled on her placid face. The Manuel Silva's been found dead with a knife wound in his throat. Funk beckoned Barkley silently, and the two hurried across the barnyard and into the woods. With the key Barkley had loaned him, Funk unlocked the padlock. He pushed the studio door open. Words seemed superfluous. Spread on the floor lay a painted canvas figure pinned down by a knife through its throat. The edges of the canvas were sharply defined, as if just cut out of the painting leaning against the south wall, with a neatly trimmed vacancy in its center. Barclay stared, closed his eyes convulsively, and then stared again. I couldn't have done it alone. She furnished the power. She'd have done it herself, but she's too... Uh, I mean, he... he was too tall. Barclay stared motionless. He was absorbing the details of a bizarre thing which confirmed him in his hasty resolution to burn Silva's painting without delay. The empty space in the painting distinctly outlined a drooping, seated figure. The painted canvas shape lying on the floor, pinned down by the knife through its pallid painted throat, could have filled that vacancy twice over. It was a full-length, standing figure. I hope you enjoyed this sinister painting, as written by Gray Luspina and performed by Barry Bowman. Now, our weekly descent into the depths has just come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode. I'd also like to invite you to check out more narrative nightmares on my program, Horror Hill, available now on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever your favorite programs can be found with three thrilling seasons to sink your teeth into, with all the tales performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. And if you drop by and dig what I do, please take a moment to leave me a five-star review and a comment, and let me know that you heard about me here on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. 
it would mean a lot to me. And don't forget to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And, of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs>